Extremophiles are some of the weirdest, coolest members of our ecosystems here on Earth, with adaptations that allow them to live where very few things can. Like very salty lakes. Back in 2013, we made a video about Australia's Lake Hillier, and talked about some of the microbes that might be making the water a bright, shocking pink. At the time, though, nobody had done a full analysis of what exactly was living in that extremely salty water, but now they have. The researchers working on the Extreme Microbiome Project study all kinds of extreme environments, and when they saw our video on Lake Hillier, they thought this bubblegum pink salt-filled lake might be worth investigating. So they started trying to identify some of the algae, archaea, and bacteria that make up Lake Hillier's microbiome, and presented their findings at a conference last month. The team collected sediment and water from different parts of the lake, then performed what's known as a metagenomic analysis, where they extract DNA and use the information to identify species. And it turns out that there are all kinds of different salt-loving microbes in the lake. They did find Denalia Salina, the algae that scientists figured would be in Lake Hillier, because it's also present in the equally rosy Lake Retba in Senegal. The algae produces pigment compounds called carotenoids that help it absorb sunlight and also make it look reddish pink. But it's not just the D. salina that gives Lake Hillier its strawberry hue. The team also found a few species of archaea, as well as a type of bacteria called Salinobacter ruber. And all of these species are also red colored and probably contribute to the pinkness of the water. And there were some surprises too. One organism that showed up in the lake samples was a bacteria known as Dechloromonas aromatica. That was unexpected because D. aromatica is good at breaking down compounds like benzene and toluene, which are used in chemical solvents. And that bacteria is typically found in places that have been contaminated by those solvents. But it turns out that Lake Hillier was actually used as a tanning station in the early 1900s. Tanning like leather tanning, not like sun tanning. Now we have the biological evidence to prove it. So the organisms in a lake can tell you a lot about it, from the science behind its color to its history. And an organism's behavior can tell you a lot about its evolution. Take humans, for example. In a study published this week in the journal Nature, two Harvard biologists looked at the factors that might have contributed to the evolution of the human jaw. And it turns out that it probably had a lot to do with both meat and stone tools. See, about two million years ago, humans, specifically Homo erectus, evolved smaller, less powerful jaws. Which is weird, because Homo erectus had bigger brains and bodies than earlier human ancestors, and would have needed more energy to sustain themselves. So if you need more food, why do you got a weaker jaw? Evolutionary biologists have been thinking about this question for a while, and they figured that it must have taken Homo erectus less effort to get energy from their food. And that could either be because of what they were eating, or because of how they prepared it. By 2.6 million years ago, hominins seemed to have been eating meat regularly, and they were using stone tools by 3.3 million years ago. It seemed likely that those developments would have made it easier to chew, but until now, no one had ever tested them. So this team fed 34 people four different kinds of foods that would be similar to what early humans were eating. Goat meat, yams, carrots, and beets. And the food came in four different forms. Unprocessed, sliced, pounded, and roasted. While the subjects ate, the researchers monitored how many times they had to chew before swallowing, and how much force they were putting into chewing. And they found that per calorie, meat does take less effort to chew than the veggies humans were probably eating at the time. And the basic processing methods, slicing and pounding, also made it easier to chew the foods. The scientists calculated that with a diet that's one-third sliced meat and two-thirds pounded veggies, the ratio that's generally found among foragers in Africa today, early humans would have had to chew 17% less often and with 26% less force. Which could be enough to explain why humans who needed more energy from food to sustain themselves evolved less powerful jaws. And the more complex processing, roasting, helped too. So when it eventually became common to cook food around 500,000 years ago, that would have made humans even more efficient eaters. So, anybody up for some mashed carrots? Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow, brought to you in part by Audible.com. Right now, Audible is offering SciShow viewers a free 30-day trial membership. Check out Audible.com com slash scishow, where you can choose from over 180,000 audio programs and titles, such as Choice Cuts, a savory selection of food writing from around the world and throughout history by Mark Kurlansky. Go to audible.com slash scishow, make sure you use that link to help us out, and to get a free 30-day trial and download a free title today. Help make it happen. So, what is precision medicine? It's based on the idea that diseases work differently in different people, depending on their genetics, environment, and lifestyle. For example,